Hello, and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Stephen Greer. Uh, this is Dr. Greer, and I want to thank the folks at the World Fusion Network for hosting us here every two weeks. And uh, I'm the founder of the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence at CSETI.org and the Disclosure Project, uh, org. And we're really excited about what we're uh, going to be talking about today. We've just uh, come from a uh, wonderful week on Marco Island in Florida, where uh, the contact that began last year with extraterrestrial intelligence and very advanced transdimensional um, contact really accelerated, I think, exponentially this year. And uh, I'm joined uh, on the call with uh, Emery. Smith, who is uh, a biotech uh, uh, pioneer and also a, quite a photographer and has done professional photography and is now doing a lot of the, uh, or most of the still photography for us uh, on these expeditions that CSETI conducts around the world. So welcome, Emory. Oh, thank you, Steve, for having me. Yeah, it's really been an amazing week. Well, we really just wrapped up this event. And for those of you who are new to the show, I just wanted to give you an idea of, of how these run. This was a training expedition. We had about uh, 22 people with us each night out under the stars, and uh, we select places where we can have a secure place. It's private and has great views of the sky, and uh, we, we're not disappointed at this site because we'd used it last year. Uh, and it's on an island uh, southwest of Fort Myers, Florida, uh, on the Gulf of Mexico, and we were using a, uh, a private beach and park uh, was a public one that we had for ourselves for private at night, and had re- and it was just an amazing, beautiful setting and perfect weather throughout the week. And we had um, from the very first night extraordinary sightings and contact that was uh, that we'll get into on this show. Um, before I get into all that, I want to just give people a background on the kind of work we do and when we gather for, under the stars to do this. And those people uh, who are familiar with the concepts of consciousness and the science of consciousness will understand this. We uh, do a process of meditative protocol where uh, I train people in uh, going into deep silent consciousness in a meditative state and then remote viewing the extraterrestrial uh, spacecraft or beings that may be either near Earth or out in space uh, more deeply. And we go through something called a coherent thought sequencing where once you image um, one of these uh, spacecraft or beings, uh, and even if you don't, you just send the image out of where you're located through a series of very coherent thoughts where you show deep space, our solar system, the Earth, and then, of course, in this case, North America and the peninsula of Florida, zooming in right into Marco Island. And this is done in a, in a train of thought but from a very deep level after we've done a puja and gone into a deep meditation. Uh, we use a mantra type meditation and also other guided meditations to achieve this state. Now, the reason this is so important in terms of extraterrestrial contact, um, and, and I discovered this back in uh, 1973, is that all interstellar civilizations are, by definition, transdimensional. And let me explain that. If you're going to go from, let's say, the Andromeda galaxy to here, we had contact with such a being in the Joshua Tree a couple of years ago. That's two and a half million light years. And so you cannot do that at the speed of light. You know, so even at 186,000 miles per second, uh, which is what the speed of light is, traveling 186,000 miles every second, it would take two and a half million years to get from Andromeda to Earth. Well, no one lives that long. <laughs> Not even Moses or whoever. So what we're talking about when we have extraterrestrial um, manifestations near Earth or in contact with us are civilizations that have gone beyond the light barrier, and I call this the crossing point of light. And that means they have entered into the world of the science of consciousness, coherent thought, what the mystics had called the astral plane, and conscious light forms, and this sort of energy. And this has actually been studied for 100 years by scientists going back to uh, Dr. Walter Russell and others. And there's no question that the entire spacecraft and everyone on board it phases beyond the speed of light. It's not like they accelerate, but it's a quantum leap, and they're in another dimension. And that other dimension 
is interfacing much more directly with linear space-time with coherent thought and consciousness because they're that much closer to the state of just mind. And this is why all interstellar civilizations, doesn't matter who, who they are, where they're from, have this science of consciousness down to a science. But by a science, I mean literally they have technologies and devices that interface with thought. So there are many accounts of people having had encounters where they will see uh, an ET being and they will communicate with them and they'll have a device and it will be actually projecting almost in a telepathic way the meaning of what the ET being is saying. I remember speaking some years ago with um, Dr. Robert Woods, who had been asked to look into this by the head of McDonnell Douglas, and uh, old man McDonald was very interested in all of this, and Dr. Woods headed up a research effort, and he found a number of cases where people had such encounters, including one that was apparently in, the, in Mexico where a craft had landed and these ETs came out, and they had sort of a little box or device right at their solar plexus, and there was no sound coming from the lips of these beings, but as they thought to the person who had contact, that person heard it in English as clearly as if you're speaking and hearing this show, or probably more clearly. So these sort of technologies, which I call uh, technology-assisted consciousness, uh, have a corollary, and that is consciousness-assisted technologies with technology-assisted consciousness. It goes both ways, where both the mind can assist the technology, but they also have technological systems that help project awareness and thought. Now, what we're doing, of course, is pretty low-tech. It's what, with what God gave us, but it works. It requires a certain amount of meditative discipline, and we also set up a, a situation where we have high-powered laser lights coming up from the group and also some electronic tones that we play. Um, and all of these the protocols, by the way, are all available at uh, DisclosureProject.org in a training program. And also, if you've got an iPhone or an, I, I, uh, an app, uh, uh, you can go to the App Store there and download really pretty amazing package for these protocols that will actually turn your phone into a magnetometer and a magnetic field reader and what have you. Now, in the course of all this contact, there are all kinds of, well, as Dr. J. Allen Hynek used to say, um, high strangeness. Let's just call it that, right, Emory? I think that you can leave, safely leave it there. A very unusual yeah. phenomenon that happened with auditory light, uh, electronic events, and Sound. sounds that occur. And, of course, materializations of craft or near materializations. And most of the time, these ET craft, particularly at this point in history where there are a lot of military uh, activity trying to deter them from coming into our airspace, we find that the manifestations have become more and more uh, transdimensional in nature. And yet you can see them with the eyes, and we're getting some amazing uh, photographic evidence and what we have set up there. Um, Emery, why don't you talk a little bit about the, the, the cameras you have and what how you've been making contact in both consciousness and with your camera and the kind of results that happen in Marco Island. I think it'd be great for people to sort of get a sense. Yeah, sure. I'd like to jump right into that. Um, I use a standard Nikon D7000. I also have a D90, D70, D60, but these, the two that I use is a D7000 uh, and a D90. I have one with a wide-angle view lens and one with uh, a 50-millimeter to um, about a 100-millimeter lens uh, that I don't use for zooming. I leave everything kind of, you know, unzoomed uh, and just focused on infinity. That way you can kind of catch everything. My ISO is set around 3200 to 6400, and I use anywhere from... Uh, you know, less than one second to up to maybe 10 seconds for exposure time. Right. And the things that happen out there are also activated by you making contact with the beings. And what that means is during a meditative state while you're out there that you acknowledge that they do exist and that they are there. And things just begin to happen and I might get a ping on something uh, for instance like to jump right into one of the most amazing moments uh, during the uh, CE5 that we had is during after a meditation we had a short break and I was being pulled to look into the uh, direction around south southwest uh, over the ocean 
And immediately I just kind of grabbed my cameras while everyone was on break. And I walked up to the water and I put them down. I just kind of was looking out there. I wasn't taking any pictures, just kind of looking, gazing with really soft eyes. And I noticed a lot of people uh, when they come out, they're trying too hard to look for things. And that's not how you do this. Right. What you do is you kind of just relax and you don't focus on any specific thing any specific thing at all. You're kind of just looking off into infinity and relaxing and being a quiet mind. And that means not thinking about too much at all. And it's hard to do a quiet mind for some of us um, that live in the real world, but you really need to hone in on that and meditate and learn how to have a quiet mind. And with a quiet mind and soft eyes looking out there, I saw this brilliant flash of light that came from the mangroves across the lagoon and with that was something that i saw i think everyone looking that way saw this it was a huge kind of celestial bright white light beautiful yes it was brilliant and uh from there i began to uh, open the shutter and take a picture uh within four seconds the picture showed up on my lcd screen and uh, one of our uh, core team members was actually beside me also a photographer she was taking a picture And she saw my screen and she saw this arc of light going from the ocean all the way over the lagoon and then kind of continuing. But the picture was not a panoramic picture, so it kind of stopped on the, you know, on the LCD screen. And she goes, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it. And with that shout, every all the group that was kind of on break, kind of hanging out, just came running up to my camera. And everyone was looking at this amazing, you know, photo on here. But I was just drawn into this photo right away. I knew this was a message and I was gazing upon the photo and I was actually following the trajectory of this light that kind of hyper jumped, you know, across the, the ocean and into our, uh, next to our circle. I was following the trajectory and I turned my head to look to the right where it might have been the point of the trajectory of where it would land. And sure enough, as I looked to the right into the bushes, there was another brilliant, bright flash of light. And thank goodness, one of our core team members, uh, Ricky Butterfast, was looking over my left shoulder, uh, was looking in that direction at the same time, and he saw it as well. And he verified, yes, I saw that. And Dr. Greer immediately sensed this energy from that area and announced they are here. And with that... Right. And this was, by the way, this area was maybe, um, you know, 30 feet from us. It was not, it wasn't like way far away somewhere. And it's Oh, no, this is 10 meters away. This is yeah, we right there. We knew that way out in the Gulf of Mexico, there was an ET, a large ET craft, probably several miles across, that was partially dematerialized out in the Gulf of Mexico. And the previous night, we had had these brilliant, uh, celestial consciousness lights and each one represented a different civilization that appeared over the mangroves across from this little lagoon where we were had our, our group set up but when I saw that picture and you can actually see it's like a white ship that materializes dematerializes materializes dematerializes and it's, it's like hyper jumping across space in these couple seconds it literally traverses hundreds of miles uh, looking out over the ocean up and it comes in, goes arcs up, makes a course correction, and then it lands and the trajectory put it right where all of a sudden we start having all these light beams appear, which are visible at the naked eye. Remember, this is actually being filmed yeah. in night vision as well as regular photographs, but they're they're not three dimensional flesh beams. They're in this kind of consciousness essence that they stay in frequently when they know that you know they're going to be not only discreet, but not be, you know, picked up and, um, by uh, military assets that are out there tracking them and, and create a problem. Um, because in the past, when they have materialized fully, they I know along the Gulf Coast have been targeted with electromagnetic pulse weapons and have been damaged or destroyed. So, uh, right, and later uh, on that evening, that did happen. Later on that yeah. that evening, there were some aircraft over the ocean, about a hundred, you know, fifty to hundred miles out, that were circling this area. Four or five craft that came out of nowhere, and they stayed out there, and, and you know, being oh, yeah. lights and, and things were yeah, coming. We'll out get into crash. that in a minute because that's another whole thing with that thing that looked like a lightning thing that wasn't. That, anyway, it's a whole amazing. So what happened? What's interesting about this photograph, and when we get all these organized and get them out, uh, we're hoping to put them out in an amazing documentary and movie this year. You, when you see it, it's it's unmistakable. It had to have traveled 
in, in mo most likely a fraction of a second. And it, it's not an artifact of the film because uh, it's certainly not an airplane or a meteorite or anything. And it, it actually, you can see the size and shape of this object. And um, it has it kind of flexes in and out of this dimension, which is what you would expect if it's an extraterrestrial, because if it, if it has the ability to go faster than the speed of light, it can bounce in and out of, the, if you will, the fabric or the underbelly of linear space-time when it's phasing in and out just at the crossing point of light, which is what this thing was doing. And, of course, when it goes beyond the crossing point of light, uh, past 186,000 miles per second, and in terms of its resonant frequency, you don't see it with the naked eye or even a camera. But the cameras are so amazing because they've become so well-developed in their light-sensing uh, cells and the, the digital um, qualities that they can pick up things that even the human eye can't. See, because I think if, if it's past like a 30th of a second, you can't see it with the naked eye, um, something like that. But with these cameras, you can. So once they started appearing and they were fully materialized, it was like it was like an oh my god moment for everyone, all 22 people, because they could see that there was this group. It wasn't just one; it was this group of ET beings that had arrived in this light ship that were scintillating. And there's nothing there. You said, well, there's got to be some kind of natural phenomenon. You know, people are just going, oh, my God, because it's so close. And, but it, it wasn't. And the color of it is a brilliant, uh, pure white, but almost like blue-white uh, light. And each one, you could feel the consciousness and that it was um, a representation as they would come on and off and then move around of different ET beings that were connecting with us as ambassadors because our whole program is about starting this pioneering effort of creating an, a relationship between uh, human civilization and these uh, interstellar civilizations that want us to join them in consciousness and space and, and in universal peace. And so th this is very much the energy that you were feeling. It was almost a, um, uh, it was celestial and extraterrestrial at the same time. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yes, and, you know, one of the things that was so amazing about this is each C5 that happens, we have this increasing contact. And I've noticed when we brought the group closer to the contact site, what we call the landing site, where these these ETs were just unloading and Dr. Greer was in the middle of this, this small patch of grass and these brilliant white and blue lights kept bleeding in and out of time and space where you could, you know, I, I walked up with the camera. I was no more than maybe you know, 10 feet away from him. And I felt this amazing, loving, beautiful energy that was just so overwhelming. I couldn't even take one more step forward because the energy that was there was so intense. And after, you know, a few minutes of Dr. Greer making contact with these extraterrestrials and experiencing this, I was able to bring the entire group of people up to uh, within about 10 feet of where Dr. Greer was so they could see these. You could actually see these with the naked eye. I'm not, you didn't have to be in a meditative state. They were making their, their self known. The increases, you know, this increased level of consciousness that's, that we're doing out there is being shown to us and they want to show us. Shock can no longer be considered because it's going to be known soon and they are doing it. And, uh, you know, a number of our group members you know, had to sit down. It was just so overwhelming for them. You know, one of the, one of the girls were, you know, hyperventilating. She sat down and was very calm and everyone just kind of, a few of the people were sitting down and just watching in amazement these lights that were coming up to people who had just been on this, on this CE5 for the very first time. Within 24 inches, these lights are beaming in and out in front of them and they're looking at them and they're, they're communicating with them and they're feeling this energy from them. And I'll, well, you know, you can talk about your experience, Dr. Greer. I know it was amazing. Well, and yeah, they're actually lighting up the air around them. And when I first went in there, I had so many that came around and I had a, a, a sphere of a rose quartz sphere that was the one that I used for the Orion transmissions at Joshua Tree a few years ago, about four and a half years ago. And when I waved, when at one point when I put it out there, there were like half a dozen of these brilliant lights that lit up. It was stunningly beautiful. Yeah, and, it was brilliant. and, you know, I, I have to say the emotional effect of it and the spiritual effect of it, these were, these are extraterrestrial. I mean, you're visible with the naked eye. We have night cameras viewing these. But at one point I kind of felt like they were all gathered. They were, and some of them were, 
uh, tall, but some of them were sh very short ETs, and you could see their signature as these. I got a feeling also like, like the children. I got a feeling feeling of little children from from other civilizations that were visiting us for the very first time because of the joyous occasion, and they were mixing in with our people. It was like a first time meeting for some of the the, the light objects that we've seen. Yeah, the, there was a very sweet, innocent, pure hearted feeling, and uh, they were very much connecting to us because our whole group had attained this sort of level of coherence uh, after the puja. Now, just to, to, to say, we sit in a circle. And when we start out the evening uh, with some introductory, you know, teaching that I do, we do a, a puja, and I, I actually sit on the sand and I do a, a, a sacred puja, and then we sit in silent meditation, and then I, we do a guided meditation I do that actually does this coherent thought sequencing and mind expansion and contact, and and I also did a prayer for the healing of the earth, inviting these uh, very highly intelligent civilizations that are involved with. Uh, Earth at this point to join us, and it was after that, and we took a break so people could stretch and what have you, that this object arced over and this whole event transpired, and it wasn't something that lasted for, you know, four or five minutes. This went on for, I guess, half an hour, maybe. Something oh, like 45 that. minutes, yes. Yeah, 45 minutes. <clears throat> yeah, I lost all sense of time. In fact, as I went into the center of where this object landed, and that was there trans-dimensionally, partially in this dimensionally, partially in, in another dimension, um, I really felt like I was going to dematerialize myself, and the state of consciousness was this beautiful cosmic awareness connecting with these beings, and it had a very definite physical effect as well, I mean, not only myself, but on other people. And there was one woman who was there who was first time she'd come to a CE5 ambassador training program. By the way, CE5 stands for Close Encounters of the Fifth Time, which is the term that I coined about 20 years ago to, to, to describe us inviting contact as opposed to just having something that we see that's accidental. And this woman was so sweet, and she said, well, she felt that she just wanted to give them a hug. And so this one beautiful uh, celestial light rose up and went towards her, and as it did, it kind of turned into sort of a pink, magenta, uh, the color of love. I mean, I know it sounds corny but and cliche, but it turned into that color of the heartfelt color as it wrapped around her, and it was just this moment of amazement. Um, uh, and a lot of people thought, you know, well, you know, maybe I'll see something very far away, but we were there on this deserted beach in the Gulf of Mexico with all this happening, and it was just beautiful. And something similar happened last year, those of you who listened to the show, but it was the, the, the activity and the contact um, in terms of it being fully manifest, we could see with the naked eye and all this stayed on the other side of this lagoon. And um, although there were other things that happened right around us. Now, I have to say, one of the things that, that happened also is that in the course of these evenings, we had some really beautiful high-pitched tones that have materialized. Oh, yeah. around us. And I'm hoping those got recorded. We have some good recording devices for audio out there. And um, what we're trying to do with all of this is to document it to the extent that you can, although we're limited with 20th century Earth technology, and we're dealing with civilizations that are several hundred thousand, several million years, in the case of some of them, technologically and consciously more developed than we are. But it, it's a bit of a, you know, a task to sort of uh, bring those two together. Obviously, when they sometimes do this, when they materialize or come over in a light ship, it's very obvious it can be photographed. But a lot of times the contact stays in the state of pure thought forms and then tonality. And, of course, everyone listening to this show, I'm sure, is familiar with the Vedic concept of name and form, where the tonality of, of something has within the tonality the form of it that manifests through pure tone into the worlds of light and astral into three-dimensional space-time. That's how certain mantras can manifest things physically. And the ancient masters all understood that. Well, I teach this sort of understanding to everyone who comes on these expeditions, but what happens often is that the ETs, when they start, when they're about to materialize and have something like this happen, they'll send a pure tone. I mean, sometimes it's like a chime or a very crystalline or electronic tone that's at the upper end of what you can hear, but it's definitely audible. And it seems to come from sort of an omnipresent space around us. You can't say, well, it's just exactly right here, maybe in an area. 
but it's very definitely coming from another dimension into this dimension. And often the people listening to it, will, as they hear it, in their mind's eye, they can see the shape of the, of the, of the spacecraft which is really interesting. It's very Vedic, name and form, the whole concept of name and form. So that happened several times in the course of this. Experience. Yeah, there were some very high, high-pitched tones and some deep rumbles during the meditation. Um, actually, when we came out of one meditation, that deep rumble that was right in front of you and I was just coming from space. It was just right in an area. You couldn't pinpoint, but it was right in front of us. And some of the people to the left of us heard it. And there was, you know, a picture taken shortly after that of a Chevron craft in the distance, you know, completely materialized that we caught on camera. Right. And in fact, this, this sound that he's describing was that it was more biological. It was biological and electronic. Right. And the sense of it, because it was right in front of Emory, I mean, two to three feet, it was between Emory and his camera. Uh, my sense of it is that it was an ET being a very large extraterrestrial being that we've had contact with and people who heard it got the sense that it was a very large being taller than I am six four the sense was that it was four or five feet taller than we are but um, but that this was followed by these these sightings of these craft and the other thing that you had there and we probably all talk about this were these amazing I call them the black boxes, these new cameras that you found that are automatic, They're used for security, uh, high-end intelligence and security work. But um, why don't you describe what they are and the kind of things that you photographed on those? Yeah, these black boxes have infrared uh, sensors and heat sensors on them that activate uh, infrared LEDs to capture things that, that are within a movement of about 90 feet from the camera itself. Uh, the camera can you know, take either day or night pictures, it, it actually thinks for itself. And if there's enough light, it will take the picture. If there's not enough light, it will help use the infrared LEDs to illuminate the area and shoot infrared. So it shoots both in color and in infrared, and it determines that on its own. So uh, this is the first time we've done this. I purchased four of these cameras, and uh, they shoot in 8-megapixel uh, format. And uh, we placed them in strategic areas that I thought uh, uh, we might feel to capture something and sure enough to our surprise we've gotten some amazing photos from these things and we can start you know talking about some of those one of the ones uh, that I really enjoyed was the one that was right at the shoreline and it was a parallelogram of really really white bright light with beams of light coming out of it and there was no one around this time the great thing about these cameras is that it records the date the time and also the temperature and uh, we, you know, we know the location of each one of these cameras, so it's all documented, and we know where the group is at all times. Right, and we were all in circle, and there was this light. It's a, it is like a parallelogram, but it's so brilliant, and it's fully there, and it's like a crack in space-time. It's hard to, it's like an opening in the space-time, and it, there's a dimension there that has been created by the ETs and this craft, and... Uh, it's how they kind of enter from trans-dimensional uh, areas. It's hard to say space, but it's trans-dimensional levels of, of frequency and energy into linear space-time. Uh, but this is an amazing, that one photograph, photograph. And then there was the other one that was uh, with a camera that was sitting right on its back, so it was shooting straight up. Right behind us. Right. Yes, right behind where Emery and I were sitting. And we were in a very deep meditative state, and it took a picture of, the best way to describe it is that it almost, uh, it looks like a ship traveling uh, over, right above us. But as it did, it opened up an area of space, trans-dimensionally, translucently, like you were looking at space with no atmosphere of the Earth, like it was a, 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 a magnifier that was a thousand times Hubble because you see the stars and then there's this area where you see a thousand more stars and points of light that are in exactly this place. And it's a wide, thick uh, area that then tapers to sort of a point. Uh, and uh, when we looked at the first time we looked at that, we just almost couldn't believe our eyes. Everyone who saw it felt that they had been teleported into deep space where they, you could see a, a thousand times more stars you can see from Earth where you have the atmosphere and the air blocking things. 
Yeah, there was little, literally just millions of other solar systems and stars in this picture, just in the area of this craft or this opening in space and time, which we captured on film. And that we'll have to definitely put that in the documentary. It was just quite amazing. Also behind the chairs, uh, Steve, was that craft. It was not a craft. It was this uh, Fibonacci sequence DNA strand that we got. It was this, I don't know how you want to explain that. Yeah, well, there were actually a couple that were similar to this, and it, uh, there are certain forms that uh, appeared that do look like the, you know, the Fibonacci sequence or a DNA strand, except it's solid, like bars of light. And uh, this is something that was very much there, and, and they're not tiny in these photographs. You see them very evidently. Uh, and what we've had happen before is that we have a sense that of the energetics of these extraterrestrial vehicles and the people on board them, they're doing something to, to augment human, uh, the human future. And they seem to be doing it to people they're having contact with, uh, even on the sort of trans-dimensional level of genetics and DNA. Uh, and this gets into some really deep stuff. But it basically is where there there's contact happening that's actually affecting the template, if you will, of our species in a way that's amazing and beautiful. And so here's this object, and it's right behind us, I believe it was. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, not that far away. And it has that same sort of shape uh, that you would associate with a, a, a vortex or a Fibonacci sequence. And the Fibonacci sequence is a very important uh, form you find in nature that creates like spiral galaxies and you know you get high enough you get into you know the perfect square and all of these but the Fibonacci sequence um, also has, has an, uh, a relationship to our DNA and the, the double helix sort of vortex of DNA but this was at a trans-dimensional level and yet it was photographed so it had to be you know if it's if it's if it's on the photograph, it's in this dimension. So it's coming from uh, right. hyperdimensional space-time and trans-dimensional uh, ET civilizations, but it's definitely in this dimension. That's why we also have other electronics, like uh, we have magnetic field meters and uh, things like radar and laser detectors and other electronics that will go off at certain points. And one of these evenings, um, from the area we were doing a deep meditation, and from the area where this landing site had happened, there was, um, well, tell them what you saw, because you saw this uh, the object, this light jump from there to yeah. in front of us. Uh, the light in front of us, or the light, the beam of light coming down from the landing site? Yeah, well, they came in front of us that had this beam, and then the magnetometer went into this spiraling orbit. Right, well, right, a light came down from above, a beam of light with a gold aura around it, and then in front of us was this bright golden light, and then the magnetometer just went absolutely berserk, and it was doing all these different tones, and it was it was relaying information to the group, and it was, it was really right in front of us, uh, but... The light that came down was more over at the landing site that I saw. And this was this white, brilliant light that came straight down, and around it was this gold aura that came around the, the light where it entered into the earth. And then, uh, I hope we're talking about the same thing because so many things happened right. that night, Steve. But and right. there's another golden light right above us that we both saw. And right, right after, right when that flashed, the magnetometer was going off. And yeah, the way the, mag the magnetometer, if you take these magnetometers and they pick up magnetic field changes, uh, if you take it up to like in the microwave oven or a, a, a camera motor that's running on a video camera, or a, it has a very specific, it just goes up and goes squeals higher. This sound was like this spiraling vortex sound that imitated this object that was photographed. And again, it had this feel of, of doing something at a very deep level within the, the chakras, uh, from the base chakra on up to the crown, that was affecting uh, physically uh, the people there. And uh, it was a very dramatic uh, burst of energy that came from this uh, object that, that came right into our circle, I mean, literally right into our circle. Um, 
So I did, I did receive like messages in my during that whole time that this was an Arcturan being from Arcturus. Yes. Yeah, we got that. I got that also. And in fact, and, when we had done that, uh, we made one of these evenings. We did a circle, and right, uh, we were doing sort of some chanting, sending a circle right on the speech. And as we're doing so, uh, I can hear this very high frequency tone. And then right above the circle, I mean, maybe 100, 200 feet up, is this golden, it's like if you could put liquid gold in the sky in the shape of almost like a uh, uh, angular, not quite triangular, a little bit between a, a teardrop and a, and a triangle, a uh, rounded sort of uh, uh, triangle craft appeared right overhead and just, just materialized and dematerialized. Uh, and it was like when everyone reached a certain coherence in, in what we were doing. And this was towards the end of the night when we were getting ready to say, you know, goodbye. It was like a little before 1 o'clock or maybe around 1 a.m. Right. And, uh, and and what we find is that so much of, of the contact that happens, what they're looking for in humans is that the group, whether it's two people or 22 people or 7 billion people, uh, that there be a certain level of coherence and a certain level of uh, not everyone's going to be at the state, same state of consciousness, of course, and we're all unique individuals, but they're looking for a certain flow consciousness, a certain coherence. And this is why the meditation process uh, is so important is preparation for contact and it's also very important in terms of people being very centered and calm because i have to tell you some people when they see some of these things that come so close to us it's not like seeing some oh well you know it's five miles away in the sky when it's there in the field and it's happening inside the circle or very very close some people do begin to get somewhat like oh my god how can this be and and, and you're seeing it you're feeling it you're hearing it and that's why it's when you uh, are going to be an ambassador to these civilizations, it's important to have this ability to, as Krishna said to Arjuna on the battlefield, and when he said, when Krishna said, a little of this with a capital T eliminates all fear. And that this he's referring to was really this higher state of consciousness, this deep, uh, pure state of mind where you're centered in something larger than your, just your ego, but you're centered in, in, in this transcendent state of being that is the universal one. It's the one mind that is shining within everyone, and that's the central part of the preparation that we do. And I think mean, it's very different from uh, anything that most people would think. You know, when you're going to go out, most people just watch the sky and think, well, you know, but there's actually a, a great deal of inner work that has to happen to be able to attain this level of contact. Yeah, the biggest benefit that I think most of us receive from this is being able to acclimate to this new life of consciousness, turn, going from what we, we already know to this, this state of mind where we can make contact. And a lot of people get that, you know, at the end of this CE5. And that's the, one of the best things you can take home with you because that prepares you to meet them halfway. I mean, they're coming from so far away. And here we are, we're making that effort to meet them a little bit of the way by being in that state of consciousness to make these connections and, you know, not to get off the subject, uh, what you were talking about being in the circle and, and doing the ohm and we were all like on the same frequency and the entire ground, which is sand quartz would, I felt this vibration that carried out through the earth. And it, I could see this in my mind that the sound and everything that were, where it was transcending into different dimensions and gold light was shooting out of this, this circle with everyone, you know, humming the same frequency and being in sync and bringing more, you know, of these extraterrestrials to, to lock on to us. And, and they love this. They see us sending this beautiful energy to Gaia and the universe. And it's what they're showing. What they showed me was that we have a greater potential than we realize. And I think everyone got that message. Right, and that, you know, one of those nights when we were doing that, we had these beautiful, there was a, um, a blue heron. It's just part of the wildlife there because we're in a sort of an uh, uh, estuary and, and um, a state park area. And this bird was very, very close. I mean, here's this big blue heron sitting there. Huh. And he's entranced with what we're doing. And, it, you know, even when Emory at some point put a light on it, so of course we were saying, what is that over there? 
it didn't fly away. It was just there in this sort of very calm, meditative state. It was like even the wildlife sort of synced into this um, energy. And, I, and I, this happened, you know, last uh, July. We were up in uh, England at this uh, on this site on this 1,800-acre farm, and we were doing um, gathering to do the puja, and there were all these steers that were in this meadow. <laughs> so they come over. I'm thinking, oh, my God, they're going to trample all through. And I've just set up the puja people and everything up in the middle of, of, of this wilderness, of this big uh, knoll that's in, in the center of, of this 1,800-acre farm. And they, they, I start doing the puja, and they come around, and each one, one by one, kneels down and sits with us just outside the puja. And they stay completely silent. They'll make a sound throughout the whole puja and the subsequent half hour or so of meditation. They didn't get up. They didn't move. They didn't snort. Nothing. And it was like they were in that state with us, even though they were cows and they were saying they were all steers. It was beautiful, actually. And then you realize that that state of consciousness is the state of the future of the world. And and that's the foundation of real peace, of universal peace, and that the, the, these, these extraterrestrial civilizations absolutely understand that. So some of the other uh, pictures I wanted to mention was the toroid. It's like a donut shape. Uh, energy of light that was unfolding in on itself, captured by one of the black boxes. And also, in the landing site, there was a half a face caught on the black box with a chin, the almond-shaped head with these eyes, these white Oh, that's amazing. Yes, like, like the eye gear. I was almost like a, um, a, um, you know, like a wraparound uh, visor and a head, and it was very, very close to the box. And these go off with movement or infrared, and there was nothing over there, and there was no people, and then there's nothing that large that would have made this go off. And you see this, it was like this beam pulsed in and out of this dimension, but would have been very, very close to us. Yes, and not to sound strange, but it, it does look like one of Hollywood's, you know, extraterrestrials with this beautiful white face with the right. more, you know, the, the eyes the, the, the slit for the eyes is much brighter and white light. And this was, you know, giving off its own energy when it was in this dimension for that moment. Um, right, right. We, this camera didn't use infrared on that on that picture. Right. Well, these were actually a great addition because we have the we have night vision video cameras running that get a, a, a lot. But then these new box cameras, because they're completely passive, you don't have to touch them, they're just, they're just pick up either the motion or the infrared energy of something large enough to trigger it, and it takes a picture. And I think it's like, I don't know, a 30th of a second that the lens is open. So it's not a time lapse or anything like that. And when you see some of these images, you go, oh, my God, these things are all around us. And we've tested it with, like, people walking in front of it, and you see a person in the beach. You know, it's a, it's, these are definitely anomalous manifestations of the ET presence, and it's so much more interesting than what most people think when they think of a kind of – everyone's fascinated with UFOs. I say, well, that's their machinery except for the ones that are made by Lockheed Martin, which are most of what people see. But the actual extraterrestrial civilizations, the way they manifest during contact is on every level, light, tone, consciousness, thought, electromagnetic sensors, and then materialization where you see either the whole craft or the persons or like an orb. And I, one of the things that I, I teach people is that you may see something that's just – a brilliant light that fully materialized, and I'll say yes, but that may actually have within it a whole group of these ETs that are being electronically teleported. It's sort of like electronic astral projection. Anyone who's ever had a lucid flying dream in their astral body, if you could do that through an electronic system, that's what we're talking about. And it's enough in this dimension that you can see it with the naked eye, but it's, you know, if you walk into it, you'd walk right through it because it's partially in this dimension. And this is one of the things that in terms of the educational curve for, for the week when people come who are new to this, it's really kind of exciting because a lot of people come from let's kick the tires on the UFO to, 
oh boy, this is, <laughs> you know, it's right. so much more than that. And of course, our whole project is less interested in the machine than in the people within the machine. And they know that. It's all about developing a relationship um, with some of these ETs and the number of people, including ourselves, who've been on these. We have ongoing contact with specific beings that are from specific worlds. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, Wonderful, and they can appear in your lucid dream state. They can appear in your bedroom at night. But when it's a group process, it creates a morphogenic field that's new. In other words, people have had contact for a long time, but coming together to do it as a group creates a morphogenic field that makes this possible for the whole planet, where in the future, all of humanity, number one, is going to be aware that we're not alone, and number two, will be aware that we can join with these civilizations and peace um, and, and go out amongst the stars. And that's we have some maturing to do before we can do that as a civilization because we have to first have world peace on this planet. But they know that the time for that is coming and the age of enlightenment is here and that this next yuga, which is a half a million years long, that basically what's happening is that we're pioneering uh, this new morphogenic field of manifesting in consciousness and deed and action and thought, uh, the pattern for the next 500,000 years. And one of the things I had happen when I was out in this contact site with all these, I felt like, I know this is cliche, I felt like Richard Dreyfuss in Close Encounters at their time, we'd have all the little ETs to come up and take your hand. Because there were so many of them that came around me. And I, but one of the things that I was shown and that I, intuited in this conversation I had with the one of the ETs there was that within the next 700 to less than a thousand years that we are going to progress to such a point that every single planet in the cosmos that has intelligent life will be linked together and united and that this is where it's beginning this is beginning now and of course from this point forward uh, that's the path that humanity and the earth needs to take, but that the foundation of that is actually a spiritual conscious foundation because you cannot go out in space, you know, with thermonuclear wars and people killing each other because someone follows one religious leader and another follows another, or one believes in one economic theory and the other another. I mean, the things that have, you know, destroyed so much of our planet are things we're going to have to leave behind and grow up into this concept of, of a, uh, of a non-universal civilization, but universal peace that really is within, and understanding that the conscious mind is the ultimate field of unified field theory, that, that the mind itself is where uh, we meet, and that all of the manifest world is really a great thought from the great being, and that we're all part of that. And the, 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 the path of humanity is to make this big transition in the next few years, because really, you think about it, 100 years, in the last 100 years, there have been classified projects that have had uh, so-called free energy, energy from the zero-point field, anti-gravity, gravity control. That was started to be experimented with in the 20s. By the 40s, it had been mastered, and certainly by the 50s, we had aircraft up there that looked like flying saucers that were made by Lockheed Martin and uh, other corporations in those early days. Now, the big task is to bring and disclose that information out and catch up on the missing century. I call it the lost century of the last 100 years. Bring out these sciences and technologies so we can solve the world's environmental poverty and justice issues. But the big push into the future after that happens is the science of consciousness, understanding the mind, understanding these trans-dimensional realities. I mean, to me, this, that's what's really exciting and everything that we're doing for the yeah. closure of this subject and even bringing out these very advanced technologies is uh, something that's, in a sense, playing catch-up uh, with what we've lost because of 50 to 100 years of criminal uh, secrecy that has really damaged our civilization and the planet. So, you know, this is really going to be the theme. We uh, have made an agreement with an Emmy Award winning uh, film director and maker who uh, wants to do a, a really major film this year with us. And it will have 
all the best of the top secret disclosure information, all the information we have on these sciences and technologies, and then the last part of it is going to be this whole science of consciousness and contact and how that happens. And, you know, it's going to be quite a, an undertaking to do, and we're going to need everyone's help and support to do it. But it's really going to be in a very independent film. There's no network in the world that will allow this to be done. But now with the way the Internet and YouTube and streaming is, we can get this to a couple billion people. And that's our goal. And, and, and because that would then create the, the shift in the consciousness, but also the support. Because we think that if this is successful, this, this film that this uh, filmmaker in Hollywood wants to do with us, I think that that will create the financial resources where we can then build um, the energy research facility and put all these brilliant scientists we've identified, all that information in one place uh, and work to bring out in, in a year or two, these sciences and technologies, because here too, you know, the government is not going to allow it. We've approached the government, and large, wealthy corporations aren't, because we've approached those. And basically, it's going to be all of this disclosure, contact, and bring out all the systems for running our civilization for thousands of years, all the high-tech energy and transportation. That has to be done by we the people, because the folks who have so much power and wealth really don't want to see that change happen. They're benefiting quite nicely. The, and it isn't the 1%, by the way. It's the point zero 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 one percent and just to make this clear, it's, it's, a, it's the uber elites. There are two or 300 corporations and individuals who pretty much control the macroeconomic system of the world. But this isn't going to change by them doing it. They'll do it with us when it becomes inevitable is what I see. And the way it becomes inevitable is that we need a global springtime, like there was the Arab Spring. We need a global spring where the whole world understands we're not alone, that the science and technologies are here, it's time for us to make peaceful contact that's open with these civilizations, and it's time for us to run our world, uh, at least on the kind of sciences and technologies that Nikola Tesla and T. Townsend Brown and others had in the first half of the 20th century. So, you know, we certainly ought to be at that point. Uh, and, and that's really what we're attempting to do. It's, it's certainly a, a, a major undertaking, and I just want to say anyone out there who can help us with this project, uh, both with the film, the distribution, networking, just uh, sign up at uh, disclosureproject.org or send us a note and we'll, uh, we'll pull you into what we're doing. It's very, very exciting what's happening. Yeah, it's a very exciting time. We really need your help. So if anyone has any of those uh, co contacts or connections, you know, please check uh, on CSETI uh, or which, which website would you like? For them to yeah, disclosureproject.org. Disclosureproject.org. Where you can sign up there or at cseti.org. And if you want to go to cseti, cseti.org, and find out, we're going to be in um, the, the high desert of Colorado in June, from June 18th to the 24th. Um, and I have you know a small sort of ranch and land out there that we use, and it's in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, and this is where we've had so many amazing contact experiences oh my goodness. in the past 20 years. In fact, last year, Emory got a picture of a, a golden ship literally hovering right at ground level, right outside our circle, and um, we have another one that launched right in front of us, and you can see clear as the bell comes up from our land right in front of the mountains, and it's this light beam ship. And so we're going to be there on those dates. And if you want to join us, contact um, the, the, the training information at cseti.org. And, um, again, those are limited. We usually have around 20 to 25 people max. Um, and that includes our, our um, senior team of people who have been doing this for many years. So, But if you want to come, um, let us know. And, and I hope to see you under the stars. It's just an amazing experience for anyone who ever does it because it's it's a course in higher consciousness, meditation, Vedic teachings, the puja, ET contact, and the future. I mean, it's kind of a lot, but this is the, 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 the major themes of what we cover over the course of a week. And uh, we're going to be in this beautiful spot that uh, has been so important over the years in terms of contact for uh, for our group and also for other people who you hear from accounts from Native American people in that area who've had amazing contact with extraterrestrial people from the stars, as they say, um, in this area. So that's where we'll be. And I uh, hope to see
see you there. Yeah. But um, we're about to run out of time. Emory, I want to thank you for all your hard work and dedication and heartfelt involvement with this. Oh, well, thank you, Steve, for having me on, and um, I'll always be there to support you and see Sunny and everyone else, and I'm looking forward to meeting everyone uh, out at Crestone, and uh, we'll see you soon. We'll see you soon. Everyone else, keep looking up and be in touch, and thanks again to all the folks at the World Pusher Network for hosting us here. Until next time, this is Dr. Stephen Greer with Conversations with Dr. Greer. Bye-bye.